Welcome back. Now, Central Bank Governor Dr. Patrick Njeroge has been a bit of an, an, an enigma since taking office in June 2015. A relative outsider joining from the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Njeroge has already shown himself to be a stickler for financial prudence, shutting down two banks and ongoing efforts to streamline the banking sector. Eight months down the line, we catch up with him to keep track of Marta's fitness, monetary policy and his plans for the banking industry. On an unusually cold Saturday morning, we arrive at Karura Forest to meet Patrick Njoroge, Kenya's central bank governor. A running enthusiast, he's part of a new running club set up by the staff of the central bank ahead of the First Ladies Half Marathon. Everybody's really excited about this. It's an occasion for us to do things together. Um, it's not just about running. It's about ourselves, who we are, um, and feeling that uh, we are part of a team. From 6 30 every Saturday morning, the team starts off by warming up and then head to either a 5 kilometer or a 10 kilometer run. I'm not a uh, swara by any means. I am uh, more of a tortoise. The first thing is, actually when I was in, uh, in the United States, when I was in Washington, I used to follow the runners, the Kenyan runners. And they always, their success was really a motivation for me. <laughs> <laughs> and after his 10 kilometer run, the governor takes a break to freshen up as we head to a coffee shop to wait to hear more about his story. And as the governor heads off, I catch up with his deputy, Sheila Mbijiwe. I ask her what it's like to work with the governor, especially now that the bank is about to celebrate CBK at 50 in September this year. He's, he's, he's a person that's principled, he's a person that's dignified, and he's a person that's easy to work with. His, 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 his mandate seems to be to build networks, to build groups, to build teamwork. And obviously in that environment, everybody thrives. About an hour later, the governor joins us for coffee. I started uh, Standard One when I was four years, one month. Well, you, you must have been a very smart child. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, in any event, I mean, it's just my mom was a teacher, so it, I guess it was easier to bring me to school than to leave me um, at home. Jaroge grew up in a farm just outside Fika, went to the Mangu High School, Strathmore College, and later to the University of Nairobi. He remembers his childhood with fondness, specifically the life lessons he embraces until today. Our parents obviously taught us to be uh, very, to be very serious about our whatever we did, everything we did. So academics were important, um, and they pushed us in study and so forth. But they also put so they also put in us a sort of a work, work ethic, you know, doing things right, finishing things even though they were difficult and so forth. And his faith has been making headlines since his appointment. The Wall Street Journal referred to him as the Opus Dei central bank governor shaking up Kenya. The BBC titled his story, Kenyan bank boss who doesn't want a luxury house. I asked Njoroge about his faith. Our faith is a very important element in our family. And we learned that. But also we learned that our faith, our work ethic, the way we deal with people, um, it's not, uh, all those things are one package. Growing up, Njoroge wanted to be an engineer. He did a lot of reading which is another thing I enjoy doing. And I read virtually anything I could lay my hands on. And, uh, and this, it dawned on me that really engineering, electrical engineering wasn't what I had in mind. But even then, a central bank governor wasn't something that crossed his mind. I live one day at a time. I never have a, I don't have a plan, you know, next 10 years or whatever, at least in my career. After a short stint at the Ministry of Planning here in Kenya, his career blossomed at the International Monetary Fund in the United States, where his last job there was advisor to the managing director. I was at the top of my game, um, done everything there was to do. Sure, it could take me a few more years, I would retire, I could retire anywhere in the world. 
After 20 years as an economist at the IMF, the office of the Central Bank of Kenya had a vacancy. But then this opening came up and I began thinking about it and it became clear that if I didn't apply, I would never know uh, if really I would have made a difference for my country. How do you respond to critics who raise concern that you would bring the IMF and the Bretton Woods Institution kind of leadership um, to the central bank given the perspective that uh, African countries generally have on the IMF? You know, Terian, I am very independent, uh, meaning independent-minded. Uh, I'm an economist. I look at things. Um, I have training of looking at numbers. Uh, that's the way I make my decisions. It's not looking at the playbook that has been written by the Bretton Woods institutions or, you know, some analyst in some ivory tower or you know, PhD paper by this. No, it's not that. Now it's just over eight months since Njoroge took over the baton. And if Kenya's monetary space and the state of the banking sector is anything to go by, then it's been a rough ride for the governor. The interest rates, if you looked at it a little more, but uh, there are also some macroeconomic problems. So those were obvious. I mean, and we knew we had to deal with those. The state of Kenya's banking sector has for a long time been hidden behind good-looking profits, but the truth could be fair from the numbers given. But there are other things that actually shocked us or caught us by surprise. And I think one of them is the state of the banking system. Uh, of course, we, from the outside, it appeared that things were okay. And uh, also looking at the various numbers, you know, things appeared stable. But then Dubai Bank happened. Uh, we put it in receivership and then uh, in uh, liquidation. And if that wasn't enough, the House of Kurds was beginning to tumble. And then shortly thereafter in October, um, October 12th to be precise, at 4 o'clock in the evening, we found out that there was a problem in Imperial Bank when the directors walked in and that the central bank and explained to us the problem. And so we had to deal with it aggressively. Uh, I have to tell you that, the, that we took over, the, we put the bank in receivership on the 13th, the next day. But what you don't know is what happened between 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock the next morning. There were 28 branches, all of which we had to, this was a bit like a military operation. You had to have people in all 28 branches before uh, and deal with all those, of course, and take care of all these things, take care of the IT, take care of this. It's, a, it's not just a flipping a switch. Jirog is passionate about changes in the banking sector and is already pushing banks to deliver. I think banks were probably a bit too comfortable and maybe we are pushing them so that they feel very uncomfortable, which is good. Um, but I think the point is when we talk about innovation, uh, we are not just talking about a new app. You know, oh yeah, we are innovating, here's our new app. It's more than that. You know, their systems, for instance, um, uh, reducing their costs. You know, one of the things that customers um, have been asking is the cost of credit. And, uh, and a key element there is the spread. Uh, so banks are not responding to the KBRR as you would have expected them to? KBRR was a solution that was, uh, that, that was put in place even as everybody knew that this was a temporary solution. So it's a bit like uh, it's a camel, you know? It's something, yeah, and uh, what is clear and is uh, the problems of the KBRR have come to, I mean, are now quite obvious. And uh, it's true, we need to review this. And we have already started that. We are actually at the tail end of it um, with the Kenya Bankers Association. The central bank was accused of high-handedness in cushioning the shilling when the dollar strength was weakening the home currency. We will not let actors act 
uh, in, uh, in discriminatory in the FX market. So yes, we were very quick and aggressive in terms of making sure that there is market discipline. That is true, and we stand by that. Um, but other things in terms of the level, no. The level, we let it go. Um, but we are very careful about the volatility side. You know? The governor's entry is heavy with matters banking, from dealing with interest rates, which continue to be priced exorbitantly, despite fervent attempts to lower rates. Recently, Standard Chartered Bank's chief economist Razia Khan said Kenya's currency is expected to depreciate farther against the dollar and could hit the 110 shilling mark. Other economists are giving mixed views, with the majority, however, predicting a stronger shilling in 2016. But the central bank is disconcerted by some of the news. What worries me, Terian, is predictions. Uh, that have no basis. I would like to ask whoever makes those predictions to um, to defend their predictions, and maybe that's what we need to ask them. What is the basis for that? These are random numbers, and um, we are not going to go after ghosts. Uh, that's not our business. Um, so we are in the business of credibility. They say numbers do not lie, and the growth of Kenya's economy has been pegged at just over 5% in 2016 by the majority of analysts. What is the governor's opinion? I posed this question to him. I would say that I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, maybe to explain this, 2005 was, uh, no, 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 2015, last year, was an year of change. Well, we put together, or we brought back macro stability, dealt with uh, a lot of the issues, including interest rates, um, and uh, and one of the things that we have, we, one of the points we've been making to investors and banks and others is that this is the time now to begin thinking long term. At the end of February this year, audit firm PricewaterhouseCoopers ranked Kenya third globally on martyrs' economic crimes, an issue that is likely to continue to dent Kenya's image to investors. From where I stand, uh, our mandate is very clear. We have a piece of task that we have to deal with that involves banks, that involves what we do, it involves putting in place systems that are going to deal with those issues in the banks, in the, in the institutions we deal with. So that's really our commitment. Um, at the end of the day, will we prevail? Uh, my sense is yes, but I think the point I would make is it's not just about putting systems in place. If it was that, then the problem could be resolved by flipping a switch. It's that, it's also the demonstration and standing by what you believe in. As we wind up our interview, I'm curious about the things that worry the central bank governor, whose background speaks of sterling ethics and atmos delivery. The good performance or the failure of the central bank will be pegged to his name. We can uh, do things above board and uh, every single institution that relates to us has to do the same. So transparently, accountable, um, and we are pushing not just the minimum standards that are set of accountability or uh, transparency and all that. We are doing much more than that, and we should be doing much more than that. What are some of the things that keep you awake at night? People. I worry about when I make decisions about people. Uh, it's the most important decision I would make, not about interest rates. Uh, and, uh, and yes, you, you know, you are it's the most important decision we could ever make is who is where, um, how is that person working and so forth. So yeah, those people problems are the ones that bother me the most. Jiroga's term runs four years, and most Kenyans are hoping that his strong economics background, his religious grounding, and strong stance on a clean banking sector and fair monetary policies will mark his term, specifically at a time when Kenya's star is starting to fade. Terry Ann Chibet, 
for the business center. Well, uh, great interview there with Dr. Jerogan. Very many questions coming in for him tonight. I guess we'll have to uh, uh, compile all of them and uh, give them to send them to him. All right, thank you very much, Mike. And of course, as we promised, we are hosting uh, Joshua Oigara, the KCB, KCB Group CEO tonight. And we'll be looking at the state of Kenya's banking sector, of course, in your capacity as a chairman of the Kenya Bankers Association. And uh, the good news as well on your results announced today. So we are looking forward uh, to that interview. Thank you, Terry. Citizen Business will be back in a moment. <laughs>